Hi everyone, welcome to Type Talks. Today we have a live Q&A with an ENFP called Kevin. Would you like to tell us a bit about you? Sure. Um, professionally, I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I have, uh, I'm a partner in a private practice just southwest of Chicago in a, in a city called Burr Ridge. And um, I've been doing this for a number of years. Uh, I see about 30 clients a week, plus a teen girls group that I run on a weekly basis. And uh, I do individuals, couples, family um, counseling, as well as the group psychotherapy. And um, I love it. And uh, I have, as, a, as typical ENFP fashion, I have quite a few um, hobbies and side interests, some of which are professional, some of which are just for the love of it. Although I do love all of the things that I do. Ooh, what are your side hobbies? Well, again, one of the signs of the ENFP is a very, uh, a very wide-ranging resume, and uh, you know we love we love the the latest shiny interest. Um, but there's some that are sort of bigger for me than others. Um, I have a small leatherworking and drum making business where I make Native American style drums, hand drums, and powwow drums, called Kel Leathercraft. Um, I'm also an operatically trained singer, so I uh, have performed in some local community operas and I'll do performing gigs. Um, I've been in several professional a cappella groups and um, I love making things. I love making art. Um, I've been experimenting with wood cuts lately where you cut a, an image into a block of wood and then use it like a sort of wooden stamp. And uh, I love making Celtic knots with those. So Celtic knots is a, a style of art where there's lots of lines weaving in and out. And for some reason, I'm just obsessed with Celtic knots. So when I make art, I just sort of put them on everything. That's amazing. That's the embellishment everything needs. <laughs> you know, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Yeah, and Kevin will be speaking at the APTI Winter Conference, where the keynote speakers will include John Beebe, the creator of the Eight Function Model, Joel Markowitz and Antonia Dodge from Personality Hacker, Dario Nardi, the brain scientist or the neuroscientist, and Linda Behrens, the creator of Interaction Styles. And so if you'd like to see Kevin and all these amazing speakers, the winter conference link will be linked below. And if you're free and it's in February, you can attend and meet some of the giants in typology. And so now that we've talked about that, I'm wondering, Kevin, if you could tell us about your cognitive function stack, starting with extroverted intuition. Oh, yeah. I love discussing the cognitive function stack. Um, I use it a lot with a lot of my sessions. Um, it's I love teaching people the basics of the model. It never gets old. But um, so, what sort of questions can I be answering about the the stack for me? You, you know, I, I I can just sort of riff on it, or there's sort of specific points that you you want to hit with each of them your experience with it so what i'm aiming for is how does it present itself in you okay well we've got eight to get through um feel free to interrupt me um or just sort of let me go and see see uh so the flow that develops there um when i'm ex I'll, I'll sort of start with sort of like my almost buzzwordy understanding of the functions just so like not that my the listeners are not familiar with them per se but maybe i sort of see them in a slightly different way or maybe my reminders for myself might um, be something new as far as a mnemonic device for others uh they also it also highlights how i understand the functions um to your question um ne extroverted intuition i think of as i i when i'm explaining it to clients i tie it to the scene in Marvel Infinity War where uh, Doctor Strange it pulls out the time stone and then looks down like 64 million different possible futures to try to figure out what's the best way of confronting Thanos. And that to me is the perfect image for how I experience the NE function where I'm constantly looking at from this present moment, what are all the different possibilities 
uh, what are the sort of different branches of the multiverse from this moment? And um, and it's constantly rendering, taking in the new um, information of the moment and then figuring out where, where to go from there. So that's where, uh, for me, FI in, in um, introverted feeling comes in is how basically how to sort all these different possibilities. How do you decide which ones to go down and which ones not to go down? And that's where introverted feeling for me comes in as the Watson to the Sherlock Holmes of the dominant function and um, says, well, well, these are going to be the most important. Um, these are going to fit most with your values. These are going to fit most with um, what you find meaningful and what you want to prioritize, what seems really worth doing. And that's where with the introverted feeling, my buzzword or sort of go-to is um, values. Now, I, I think the argument can be made that the feeling function in general could be called the valuing function. Um, feeling in English is such a weird word or a strange um, word for this, uh, for typology, because colloquially we use the word feeling for all of the functions, you know, you know, I'm, I'm feeling my jacket would be sensing. I feel like it might rain tomorrow is intuition. I feel like you're not listening to me is thinking. And, uh, you know, I, I, I feel uh, like this is the best way forward would be sort of a feeling function. So for me, you know, values uh, for the introverted feeling function is about um, harmony on the inside. So that's where, in addition to valuing, feeling function, in my understanding, is about finding harmony. Introverted feeling about harmony on the inside with my morals, ethics, and values. My moral compass would be my FI function. Um, and then FE would be about finding harmony in the world with others, um, sort of collective values. Um, I, I think my NE function is also uh, being an extroverted perception uh, type dominant is where I get a lot of my spontaneity, a lot of my um, riffing on topics. I like how I conduct therapy, I think, is a big reflection of um, my typological functions where, you know, I, I'm very open to what the client wants to bring in that day and work on. So I've got, of course, the overall treatment models, the overall treatment goals. I think that's where my tertiary TE comes in, you know, organizing things in that way. But in any one moment, you know, if, if a client comes in and they've had a horrible week because of an unexpected disaster, we'll spend the whole session on that. Or if someone comes in with a question, you know, I'm not afraid of tangents. I, I find that for my process, all the good stuff happens in tangents. I learn so much about clients. I learn so much about um, the issues that they want to be working on that if we go on a good tangent, I can usually get some really excellent information that then happens to be essential for the main focus. So if I limited that, if I actually sort of pruned down all of those NE spontaneous tangents, spontaneous directions, it actually hurts the process and by extension, you know, um, hinders the, the therapy outcomes for my clients. So. While I do have to sort of stay on task, and that's the development of being more of a mature ENFP as opposed to like the squirrel from Ice Age that's just, you know, I think his name was Scrat or Scrit or something like that running all over the place or or the dog from Up who, um, you know, was always like, I think his name was Doug, you know, always saying squirrel. You know, the, the ENFP is always in danger of going squirrel and and losing track so that's where i think the fi again um a well-developed fi sort of keeps that ne in check from going oh that's so shiny let me go do that and saying but is it worth it is that going to align with the most important thing that you want to be doing right now or or in general recognizing things like, you know, we've got a finite amount of time, which could be, you know, the TE function chiming in. And then the FI saying, right, so let's make this the priority. And then NE going, ah, okay, yes. And here's how we can do it. 
Don't you hate to just pick one possibility? <laughs> uh, I think that's definitely my typological prejudice is like, why pick one when you can have them all? You know, it's like the kid in the candy store or a, or a child in the grocery cart just grabbing things, you know, and be like, no, we can't get that. No, this isn't good. No, okay, yes, that's very pretty, but that's not made from good things. This isn't even for you. Um, but I think, again, what is important to keep in mind for me with typology is not just the starting point of, of typological preference, but the individuation process, the maturing process, how one develops within the trajectory of one's type. Not that you then change type preferences, uh, you know, um, but that within your type, as you develop greater integration, greater cooperation, um, there's a tempering and a honing that happens. And I think that's where the sobering truth for the ENFP about picking possibilities is in any one moment, you only get one option. You get one chance, one selection. And anytime you choose something, you're inherently not choosing everything else. So that is a sobering proposition for someone who's very excited about so many possibilities. But if you try to choose everything, you actually choose nothing. So if you try to do everything, you don't get any of it done and none of the fantasies and none of the, the vision um, actually comes to fruition. So I think that's where the SI comes in for me too, is those limits. And I think the last thing the ENFP develops or wants to develop is the limits. Um, you know, oh, let someone else deal with the minutia and the details of how to execute it. I'm the vision man. I'm just going to come up with, how, you know, the ideas and where we're going to go. Um, but if you don't have an appreciation of those things, like how to make something real, um, the vision suffers too. So the rising tide raises all ships. You know, when you develop one function, um, the rest have to accommodate that. But I think that accommodation process is actually good. Um, SI is interesting for me, going back to the type stack. Good question, though. Thanks for the question from the uh, participant. Saw that come up. Um, The SI for me, it, it's interesting. I, I've i done a lot of office management as part of the practice here, and it's a lot of billing and notes and spreadsheets and organizational like flow of paperwork and accounting for things. And then I also have to do my own taxes because I'm self-employed, so I can't just like hand one paper over to a professional and call it a day. I have to like itemize and do all these things. And I hate it. I hate it. I don't like it. Um, it's tedious, but it has to be done. So again, as part of the maturing and as part of the developing of my own journey, um, I try to find ways to bring the other functions in on it. So for example, if I'm doing a lot of billing, I'll put on some music that I really enjoy to sort of toss a cookie to the NE, you know? Like, okay, well, yeah, you don't want to do the billing, but uh, how about how about some dance music, you know? And, and that might be enough to say, well, fine, I'll let you do billing for a little bit, but then we're going to go do something fun. Um, and I've also taken sort of a TE pride in my spreadsheets. So I think to myself, how can I make this the most efficient possible where I put in the least amount of information and because of all the formulas and like mechanics that I build into this spreadsheet that I put in this tiny little bit and out pops everything I need. So um, I, I've developed a lot of pride for those spreadsheets, whether it's for a budget or um, uh, I, I like the comment that just came up, do taxes while eating cake. Yes. Never fails. <laughs> I think the uh, I think the SI function sometimes does want to say, "Well, let them eat cake." As in, this is important. The frivolity can wait. 
Cakes. What's good. beautiful about this is that you're bantering with another NE user in my live chat. So <laughs> you're showing NE by NEing with the NE user <laughs> and brainstorming with them and ideating with them in the in the chat. I'm um, I'm getting my doctorate right now in in Jungian psychology and archetypal studies, and I just finished my last residential, which. It's a hybrid program, which is mostly online. And then every quarter there's um, some in-person live, um, well, not in-person because we have to do it remotely now, but um, some live uh, discussion and class time lecturing and that sort of thing. And in my cohort, there was another male ENFP. And let me tell you, not only do we get along and enjoy bantering with each other outside of class, but um, I sort of pity the teacher having to like corral both of us that are so excited about the topic and wanting to ask questions and offer this anecdote. And uh, yeah, two, two ENFPs bantering is sort of like the most on brand thing for the ENFP, I think. It is, yeah, the conversations with NE DOMs, I have to be the one to put a stop to it. Otherwise it would continue on indefinitely until the earth collides into the sun. <laughs> Yeah. Um, all right, all right. So let's discuss your shadow stack. How do you experience your opposing function, introverted intuition? I I, I experience it mostly. Um, I really like talking about the shadow stack in general. I really like this quote. I think it was from either BB's work or Jung's work. I can't remember. Probably BB because obviously. Um, he, you know, wrote mostly about, or, or is most known for bringing the shadow stack, you know, more to the fore. Um, but that these lower, these lower functions are so distant from consciousness that they're experienced as happening to the ego rather than the ego is the one doing them. So for me, I experience um, the NI most potently for myself when I'm doing meditation and it's really hard to get me to do meditation. Like for, there were three years where I meditated for an hour every day. And if I missed a day, I'd do two hours the day after. And that was a hard discipline for me to keep up. I think very good for me developmentally, but it was hard. And it was in those moments when the NE chatter and rendering of possibilities would sort of quiet and the energy could sort of go into the unconscious and come up as these longer range considerations, you know, or there'd be sort of a flash of instant clarity about a specific situation turning out a specific way that I just hadn't considered before because the NE goes out in every direction, but therefore doesn't go out super far. Whereas the NI I experience is more of a, a long range sort of single focus that then sort of just shows up as like whole wholesale, like, all right, here it is. And it's not really interested in debate or discussion. It just sort of drops it. Um, a metaphor I've used is um, there was this there's this movie that didn't get really good reviews, but, uh, and I hadn't really heard of, but it was like the RIP, RIPD or something like that. The rest in peace department, rest in peace department. It had, uh, Jeff Bridges as one of the main characters. And I think Ryan Reynolds and they were cops in the afterlife, but this whole department was run by these deities or something that would just send those like banking tubes of orders. And so like, you know, the vacuum tubes that you might see at a bank, and you press a button and, you know, out, out it comes. And the orders would come in this vacuum tube and there would be no discussion. You can't like dialogue with them or talk with them. It just shows up and that's it. And you have to deal with it. And I think that for me is the NI function is that it just shows up unbidden, uncompelled, and you can ignore it, but there, it just sort of, there it is. Um, and I'm, I'm fortunate to have one of my best friends with NI dominant preferences. He's an INTJ and, um, you know, he's been a, a very good friend for, um, 
you know, 15, 16 years, probably at this point. He's also my brother-in-law. So there's that, but he was my, one of my best friends first. And, um, he sees things, you know, he's very developed in these functions too, but he sees things like two and three years out where he'll give me feedback about something. He's like, you know, you should really work on this issue. And I'll go, ah, what do you know? That's not right. Then two or three years later, I'll, um, I'll be talking to them. I go, you know, I really think I should work on this issue. He goes, I told you that three years ago. And I'm like, well, I guess I wasn't ready yet, was I? And and also sometimes what he'll say will essentially be true, but it'll sort of get jumbled a little bit on the way out. And so I'll be attached to the words he said instead of the image that he's bringing up that he's sort of attributing, finding words to after the fact. And we'll get in these arguments when we actually agree or when I actually think he's right at the end, but how he brought it up sort of you know annoyed me or upset me. So I've had to learn to deal with the NI in myself because I've had to learn how to deal with the NI in my friend Kyle as well as vice versa. So I think a very helpful friend to have for me in regard to the opposing function. Mm, yes. And how do you experience your sixth function extroverted feeling? As we get lower down from there, well, at all of the opposing functions, I've started, my process has been sort of like dismissing or demonizing them as like, for some reason, not good uh, or inferior, which I, obviously is a projection, right? It's just the bias of the, um, the top functions uh, not, not wanting to go in that direction. But uh, as I've learned more about the type, um, I've sort of redeemed them for myself, where I've been able to see the value in the functions in a way that prejudicially I didn't when they were more unconscious, if that's possible, um, when I was younger. So like for the NI, like I was saying, when I would hear that from my friend Kyle, I would um, dismiss it or get really irritated by it, or I'd be really frustrated like he wasn't getting what I was saying because he was taking it in this other direction. With FE, again, I think this is the inherent bias of the FI is that it's like, oh, you know, those those rudderless ships, those, you know, feckless people that have no like moral compass, they just want to go with the crowd, you know, whatever. They just want everyone to be happy. Like who wants everyone to be happy? You know, sort of was the original bias. And, um, you know, I've. I've come to realize that um, that valuing harmony itself is a noble value. Um, that there's nothing wrong with fitting in. That it's okay to like things that other people like. And for me, I still have to work on that bias where if I like something and then I find out it's really popular, part of me just wants to go, well, never mind then. Like when I was a little kid, I loved Harry Potter until I learned that everyone loved Harry Potter. And then I was like, well, now it's not special anymore. And so, you know, I, but I, I've learned to let myself love those things. Let, learn to let myself love, you know, um, pop music, you know, oh, it's popular. Ah, it can't be as good as something obscure or old. Um, but, uh, you know, I, and I think, I think some of that has come from my group work, being a group leader and learning how to learning the value of a good group dynamic. I also was a um, a DJ for weddings and parties for six years, and you have to be able to read the room and you have to be able to know what the room wants and what people like and uh, where to go next with that and and. The bride and groom for the weddings, like that's one of the, that's one of the most important days of their their relationship, and it's a sacred day, and um, and that they are trusting you with that day. As the DJ really runs the whole reception. You know, they're the ones that everyone goes to. The videographer, the photographer, even the like priests or or pastors doing the blessings, the people giving the talks, even the bride and groom are saying, "Okay, so what do we do?" Right? 
you're you're a ritual leader with that of the group's harmony and if you and if you don't care about that then you shouldn't be doing a job where that's a sacred responsibility so i i think for me that's that really drew on the fe is learning how to um have my values not betray the fi and therefore steer myself into situations where i can have both where i can be loyal to my values while also being a part of a group in a in a good or a healthy way i think in some ways that that is, that's accomplished best for me with leadership positions where i can have a, a little bit more say over the the norms and the the tone of the of the event so the dj and the group leading really helped with all of that yeah, you can take your cake and you can eat it too. You don't have to just have the FE. You can have both the FI and the FE together. And so I'm wondering, what is your experience of your seventh function trickster introverted thinking? Now, this is actually my sister's uh, auxiliary function. So another, another high value relationship that I've had to learn how to work with, um, especially because we uh, are also in this practice together. We're also, we're all clinical social workers. Even my wife is a clinical social worker and, and works with children in a new division we just opened specifically for kids. Um, so I, I think again, it's been a lot of, working through my initial biases and i think these are the ti or sorry the te biases right the te looks at the ti and goes ugh, you know just like the fi looks at the fe and goes ugh. and i and i think it works the other way with the opposite attitudes you know vice versa but um i see the ti as being um privileging the idiosyncratic you know, what works for the individual, what fits for them, you know, the focus on the subject with the introvert thinking. And I, I see that in like philosophers where they're always coming up with their own language system to explain their experience. And then they like don't want to use anyone else's. They just want to use their own and it can make them very difficult to understand. Um, I, I think my prejudice was also seeing TI people as being very stubborn. You know, like, why can't you just like work off of the system that we're all using? You know, the TE being like, no, we've all agreed to these conventions. Okay, this is how you organize things so that everyone can find it. Why are you putting them in this order? Oh, that's the order that you bought them in. So that's how you think about it. Oh, okay. Well, no one else will be able to find your books, you know. Um, I experienced the TI coming up for me in um this might seem like a strange sort of niche for it to arrive in but in um games i i play a lot of board games with my ch children clients and teen clients it's a very useful diagnostic tool how people make decisions in games is a direct reflection of how they make decisions everywhere in their life so uh and, and it creates a shared like vernacular or a shared experience uh, with the clients too, where I can say, um, you know, oh, you know how you weren't thinking ahead with this homework assignment? That's like how you weren't thinking ahead when we were playing checkers the other day. And remember how that went? And they go, oh yeah. And vice versa, as they get better at the games, they can get better at the decision-making elsewhere. And this sort of showed up spontaneously when I was playing Connect Four. My last salary job was exclusively doing therapy with like younger kids and, and families. So sometimes with young kids, they'll fixate on one game and every time they come in, that's what they want to do the whole time. And so I cannot express to you how many games of Connect Four I have played in my life. It might be a record, I don't know, but there was one day where I was playing Connect Four, which I was never good at when I was little. I hated it. The only thing I liked doing was filling up all the things and then moving it to watch them all fall. Um, but I always lost. And so I'm playing this game, you know, for the thousandth time. And 
something just clicked with it. And I saw the underlying structure of the game mechanic. I saw through the colors and the like plastic and that. And I went, oh, like it just started at first with one really, oh, there's only seven moves you can make at any one point, which might've been obvious to someone with TI higher up. But for me, that was a realization like, oh, well, if there's only seven moves, I can set up traps where then they only have six moves or five. Now they're really limited. Oh, I wonder if I can steer them around. And just by playing the game over and over again, like my TI unconsciously was like processing it. And then it'll just sort of almost like that vacuum tube again, just sort of show up with, oh, and here's the underlying structure behind that game mechanic. Here's how you can turn that into a strategy. That it's like by by relating with the game or any situation, really. I mean, game is just a, a ritualized experience, right? So it could work with any experience or situation. But by relating with it over and over again, making constant mistakes, making right moves, thinking about it, evaluating, learn, it like the TI was like processing unconsciously in the background. And eventually it sort of just says, and here's how you can relate to this in a more efficient or effective way. But up to that point, it's sort of like like wandering in the dark or having to use the TE to memorize rules and structures rather than sort of like feeling it more intrinsically like I think the TI does. Um, and that way the TI can do and can experience a lot better than it can explain most of the time. But again, that might just be because for me, it's so low down there. Yeah, you explain this really important philosophy, which is the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. Mm -hmm. And so the way that you play a video game or the way that you even make breakfast is symbolic of how you approach life in general, too. Absolutely. And so it gets you to be a little bit more mindful. And so, Kevin, how do you experience your eighth function, extroverted sensing? Mostly as deficiency, I would say. Um, I've had a lot of physical struggles. I've got some genetic health issues that make the sensing world difficult, where uh, I have dampened proprioception. So I even have a hard time feeling where my body is in space, you know, on a physiological level. So the typology does not help with that. Um, and, you know, I, I grew up in a very small town that um, in some ways is like a time capsule of like the 40s or 50s because it's like isolated. Um, I only lived there till I was 10 and then I moved to, you know, let's say a more modern place, you know. Um, but my point is, is like in that in that culture, there was very clear expectations for males. And being a feeling male was not acceptable, you know. Um, so that's where I, I hyper developed the TE, you know, and in many ways, it was hard for me to settle on ENFP because I developed such a strong, essentially ENTJ persona that was exhausting, but I developed it as sort of a survival mechanism that I had to do a lot of work to reclaim my feeling function. But uh, my point is, is um, another one of those strong cultural values was being good at sports. You know, if you're, if you're going to be worth anything as, as a male, you have to be good at sports. I was not good at sports. I wasn't good at any of them. And I tried almost all of them. And I, and I worked at it and I practiced. Uh, and I real baseball was one I tried. I was like, okay, I'm going to really go for it in baseball. And I practiced and even took lessons and went to summer camps for baseball and like did extra leagues and stuff like that. At my best, I was mediocre, you know, and I worked so hard. My coach would be like, okay, we're going into, you know, as in right, right field and baseball, people know right fields where you put the people who, you know, well, at least they're out there. And, um, you know, he'd be like, okay, Kevin, this time when the ball comes to you just don't fall on the ground okay just just grab the ball take a little bit more time just don't fall on the ground and i'd be like okay and then the ball would come and i'd fall on the ground trying to get it and you know there it is so um the se feels very foreign to me you know like i've i've worked at trying to bring it in intentionally 
do like I was I was doing yoga like in weekly classes for years and that was really good for me but it was also challenging it's like I've taken some martial arts classes for extended periods of time um like I said with some of these sports I always feel like I'm just out of my element like I just feel like I'm in someone else's world and I'm just gonna do my best that like no one really notices I shouldn't be here but it just feels very sort of like writing with my left hand because I'm right-handed so it it feels just so bizarre and I can work at it and maybe get up to like mediocre, but n no one's really going to mistake me for a physically gifted person in that way. Yeah. It's like you can get it to a passable level, but then uh, it's not as rewarding to just stay in that spa space forever. And so the first question we have is, did you ever once think you were an INFP? If so, how did you tell the difference? Um, my, I, I think when people are trying to find their function, it's sort of like trying on clothes to see what fits, you know, or trying to find your clothing style to see what fits, you know, if that's um, something you can do or even uh, just think about. But um, I, I tried on first, um, I took, I think it was the Myers-Briggs. It might've been one of the other sort of, um, established, you know, reviewed instruments. I don't remember which one. And it came back INTJ and my INTJ friend, Kyle was like, no, like he was like, you can't, ha that's not right. Like we are not the same. I'm not even going to entertain this thought. And I'm like, I don't know, I could, I could sort of see it, you know, like, what if it's like, you know, what if this is me being introverted when I'm like, when I don't want to talk to people at the end of the day, never mind the fact that I don't want to talk to people at the end of the day, because I spent 14 hours talking to people all day. <laughs> um, and so Mark Grandstaff, who's another one of my typology teachers, um, he's, he's a brilliant typologist. Um, people should look him up. Um, you know, he came, we hosted a workshop for him. And uh, during our first conversation, I said something about my therapy practice. Like, I always promise my teens that no matter what, our sessions will not be boring, you know, especially when I've got teens that really don't want to be here. And Kyle turns to Mark and goes, uh, does this sound like an I to you? And Mark just goes, no, absolutely not. <laughs> So um, then I went to exploring the ENTJ. And as I was saying uh, a minute ago, I think that's because that was sort of my like ideal type, you know, as far as like conditioning, like I was taught those were the qualities that were wanted of me. Those were the qualities others thought were valuable. And so I tried to be that and I can do it. I can put on the ENTJ persona for a limited amount of time and then it just sucks the life right out of me. It's like a in a video game, like a Zelda game, when you go under the water and there's the little breath meter and it starts to go down as soon as you're under the water and then it gets to zero and he starts getting hurt, you know? that That's me and these the ENTJ persona. When I'm doing business stuff, put on the suit, I put on the tie, I put my hair back, I'm not gonna cut it, but I will put the hair back. And I'm like, ah, oh, yes, yes, I'm a business person and look at my business self. And then I get done and I'm like, woo, pull out the hair, shake it out, take off the jacket, roll up the sleeves, back to myself. The INFP wasn't ever a part of my sort of differentiation. However, um, I've noticed that people with FI dominant um, preferences uh, are usually fairly distinct. I mean, the ENFP is sort of like like all over the place in in the uh, um, in, in any iteration of its of its existence. It loves to be all over the place. The FI, you know. I mean, that the introverted feeling I think of as NI and FI as sort of the most introverted functions, if that makes any sense, and how they present. Um, I also find that 
the the FI dominant people that I work with are like they f they are deeply artistic. Like they feel art very deeply and are usually drawn to it. Like music is a common one or poetry or photography. I have some FI dominant friends that are amazing photographers. And they're just, they're, it's like they're predominantly just inside feeling these things so deeply. While as the NE is just like, and then I could go talk to that person and I could go talk to that person and all this. And the FI is like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go now and um, I'm gonna go listen to some music and you have fun with that. So that's, I, I never really had to tell the difference for myself. It was pretty uh, clear. Um, but uh, I, I often, when I'm trying to figure out the difference between like ENFP, INFP, or when like we've got, we're sure that the top two are the top two, but in which order, my my go-to is looking at um, behavior under stress. When you get off your A game, what what sort of you're like, oh, I got to watch this or this could go too far. And for the ENFP, it's sort of getting lost in the world. You know, it's just getting absorbed into the experiences. It's burning out. It's feeling alienated from the self. I, I found as an ENFP that I get lonely, not when I'm alone, but when I'm with others and disconnected from myself. I get lonely when my FI is not being honored. I think for the for those with dominant introverted preferences under stress, it's a withdrawal from the world. It's a um, pulling back into, could be depression, it could be just isolation. Um, so I often ask the person, like, what's a bigger danger for you? What's more likely to happen on accident? Getting getting absorbed into the world and losing yourself or getting absorbed into yourself and sort of shutting out the world? So that I, I don't know if that's helpful for uh, for this questioner, but that's those are some of the things that I've thought about in trying to differentiate those things. Yeah, and a few other differentiators to add on to your wonderful list is ENFPs are more likely to wonder if they're an INFP or ENFP. So they'll be like, you know, I'm a little bit introverted. You know, I like my alone time. And so they'll say, am I an INFP? Whereas I find a lot of INFPs know that they're introverts. Uh, so they're more certain in that. Um, another difference too is sensitivity. So both types can be sensitive, but I find if you're gonna put them side by side, the INFP is more likely with FI as the dominant function to be a little bit more sensitive, whereas the ENFP has their sensitive moments, but they can also be the insensitive one by accident too. Oh um, my gosh. Oh, that's, and I feel terrible about it too. I really work on being more sensitive, but that's rough, you know, wanting to be playful and have fun and then accidentally stepping on someone's feelings on accident. It's rough. Mm -hmm. And another one is action orientedness. If you compare these two types against each other, the ENFP is slightly more likely to take action a little more quickly than the INFP. The INFPs overthink way more than ENFPs to the point where the ENFP might be looking at the INFP going like, do something. <laughs> <laughs> my, my INFP clients um, often struggle with doing something. I've called it the mire. It's like they get mired in the FI and they, it's like, it's, it's almost like tar in that shadow expression of it where they just get stuck in it. And they're just like, I'll just sit here until the world makes me do something. I'm like, no, you gotta go. Yeah. And another way to tell the difference between these two types is to attend the APTI winter conference. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to learn about the functions in more details from the giants of typology. So feel free to check out the link. It's below. And Kevin is also speaking there, too. So it's all the more reason to go. I, and so, oh, yeah, continue. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, but as an ENFP, I often do. 
Um, the other tricky thing with ENFPs is they're sometimes called the chameleons of the type world because they like so many things and like trying on so many different hats. Um, they can often present as um, a lot of different types, uh, have a lot of different type preferences. So if you feel like everything seems right, you might might want to look into the ENFP a little bit more closely. Yeah, uh, Personality Hacker talks about how introverted feeling is the function most likely to see itself in everything. Mm. It's because it has so many sides to itself. It's so multifaceted in its identity and it and it spends a lot of time thinking about its who it is. And so it can see the multi-layered beauty of it. And so it, it can see itself in everything. And so it can be hard to type yourself with FI. And so Katie asks, if you have, what kinds of developmental challenges have you faced? Have you worked through these challenges? If so, how? Well, I think I've talked about some of those developmental challenges in going through the cognitive stack questions that we just went through. Um, for those who have heard that, I want to try to offer something new I would say my biggest challenge, and it's just an ongoing challenge, is saying no. Saying no to opportunities, saying no to interesting hobbies that I might want to try or pick up. Focusing, saying no, and um, letting there be negative space in my life. And I don't mean negative as in like melancholy or depression, you know, although, you know, um, everyone experiences being down at some point or the other to various degrees. We all have our grief. Um, but it's like, if there's space in my life, I want to fill it with another, like, I'm going to learn a new language. I'm going to, you know, um, learn the strategy for backgammon. I'm going, I love backgammon. Um, you know, that I'm, I've always over-programmed myself and I'm, I'm always dancing on the edge of too much. And I think the challenge has been trying to find instead of maximal, trying to find optimal. And optimal needs negative space. Op optimal needs downtime. Optimal needs time where there are no demands and there is nothing especially, especially stimulating going on. And I think that's been the hardest thing for me. So like I said, the, that meditation discipline was very um, important for me to be developing more introversion. Um, to, to, ex to expand on um, like I, what I was talking about before is I think the intersection of my gender and my type in the, the places I was growing up and the messages I was receiving really demonized the feeling function. Um, and so feelings were seen as weakness, feelings were seen as... Um, uh, effeminate in a bad way, you know, like that. I, I don't think, you know, I, I think having a healthy balance of masculine and feminine traits is important for everybody. Um, but the, the shame that came in was saying that, no, if you're male, if you're not a hundred percent uber masculine all the time and feelings are not uber masculine, uh, then there's something wrong with you. You know, you're bad in some way. And so, um, that combined with, you know, different, um, being very sensitive to like bullying and that sort of thing, which was a challenge that I went through when I was, you know, much younger. And I've since done a lot of work to heal and grow from. Um, I just shut down the feeling function. Like, like if it was one of those big switches, like those big toggles, I just turned that right off. And by the time I was like 14 or 15, I was, I had just, overdeveloped the te you know i just essentially even my voice sounded really robotic sort of high nasally robotic um 
and that was the point where I met my mentor. And that was the point where I started um, learning that I didn't have to just be what everyone else wanted me to be. I was, I would have done anything for approval. I was so hungry for approval and um, avoiding disapproval. And uh, that's, that's the antithesis to the FI. You know, it, it was just being what everyone else wanted me to be. And it made me a good act, well, good actor, you know, in high school. I was in plays and stuff and got medals and whatnot. But, you know, if I didn't get that medal, I was devastating, devastated. So I would say the reclaiming of that feeling function, the reclaiming of my own internal locus of control, that I could be what I thought the world that would benefit from, that I could live from integrity, honor, um, trying to make the world a little bit of a better place because I was alive today. And being willing to take the disapproval that would inevitably come from standing up for one value or another, because if you stand up for a value, there's gonna be people that hate you for it and that's just the way it is. Um, and that really let my TE sort of do its job as the tertiary, which is be sort of an accessory to come in, you know, when it's needed um, and, and really bring in that FI to hold its own, to temper the NE, to let NE do its job well, rather than just be a a chameleon in a different way of being matching whatever the circumstances told me to be to to really be myself and that's when i stopped doing acting um and i said i've spent enough time trying to be someone else i'm going to practice being myself so i i would say that was one of the biggest typological developmental challenges for me was really owning that fi and making that the foundation for my life. If I don't, I don't have, if I don't have my integrity, I don't have anything. And I pay a huge price on the inside. If I do something that I even suspect is immoral, it's like a crippling moral compass and it, it gets the, it gets the admiration for a lot of people, but it's also, it's a hard path to walk to be that loyal to what you think is right and that doesn't mean i am always right and that doesn't mean i never make mistakes i don't think integrity means never making mistakes i think integrity means doing everything you can not to repeat the same mistakes but to learn from them and constantly trying to do and be better but it's an impossible task mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it, it's really heartwarming to hear your story of accepting your fi that is great. So the next question is, do you have a tedious activity that you actually enjoy or is all tediousness not enjoyable at all? I was saying a minute ago that when I do art, I am uh, sort of obsessed with Celtic knots. And Celtic knots are such a surprise typologically for me because they are possibly one of the most tedious art forms that you could do. I mean, there's like, I usually thought of erasing, you know, when drawing as like fixing mistakes, but erasing is an inherent part of making, you know, Celtic knots. And I will make some of the most ridiculously elaborate Celtic knots and then, um, and they take forever, you know, and like the woodcuts, like I was saying, I start by drawing it out, drawing out the Celtic knot takes forever. You, you like draw where you want it to go. You then put little dots, you then draw other paths over that. Then you outline every one of those paths. Then you have to erase all the lines you don't need. Then you put in the little intersections, then you embellish it and you tweak it. And by this point, you know, something like this big has been taking like, I don't know, a dozen hours, 20 hours. And then carbon paper, picture on top of the wood, trace the whole thing, and then take a little tiny Dremel tool and 
Dremel it all out until you can get the image. Um, I have some in here. If, if I can, you want me to just grab one off the wall to? Yes. yes. All right. Ugh, I hate leaving the camera pan. This is a show and tell today. <laughs> sort of bad manner to leave the camera pan, but I should have had it within reach. So, like, this was one of the most recent ones I did. Ooh, pretty. Looks really yeah. nice. So you can see, like, some people could see that and go, that is one of the most tedious things a human being could do for fun. But I love them. Um, I also used to do a lot of modeling, like, not, not like modeling myself, but like making models. I, I liked uh, uh, Warhammer figures where you would learn like the rule books were like this thick and you, it'd be like a lawyer. You'd have to learn all these rules for every minute scenario. And then the modeling, the tiny little figures, you'd put these little details on and um, and I loved doing that. And I did that for several years when I was younger. Now I would say um, my wife loves fairy houses, you know, like those little decorative houses that look like a fairy live there and you make them out of like wood and sticks and stuff like that. And so I use those modeling skills to make her fairy houses and fairy doors and I give them as gifts. And um, she already, she hasn't seen them, but she knows they're coming. I made her four new ones for Valentine's Day. So, you know, shh. Um, well, she already knows, so it's not a secret. But so, uh, but those tiny details, tiny little details. And it's like, and every detail matters too. So it's like, you know, why this type of grass and not this type of grass? Why this little bit instead of this little bit? What twig? How much twig do we use? But it's just really fun. And I think for me, with these tedious experiences, it's like I use my NE all day and my FI all day with therapy. And then with these tedious things, I just zone in and know it. Like it doesn't have any feelings I have to worry about. It doesn't have, you know, big consequences other than maybe it's a little ugly or not as cool as I wanted it to be. And it's a really nice break from the, the NEFI, you know, uh, day of therapy. Mm, yeah, that's wonderful. How do you engage in a conversation on a topic you have little to no expertise in? <laughs> do you engage or do you sit back and wait for a topic you have more knowledge of that comes up? I probably talk too much. I'll just put that out there. You know, even on a topic where I have almost no expertise, I will think to myself, okay, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert. That would be, that would lack integrity. But is there a nugget? Can I relate this to something like a tiny little piece of my experience that I could go, you know, this is all I got, but I think this is kind of cool, you know? And um, I'll also just tell people, my clients, you know, there's, there's a lot of pressure to know things as a therapist. Everyone wants a very knowledgeable and ex expert. Well, not, maybe not everyone, but a lot of people like having knowledgeable helpers and so there's pressure, uh, you know, to be helpful. But sometimes I just have to go, I think you should Google that or, uh, you know, you should go see this expert for that thing. I have a hard time sitting back. I really do. Um, it takes a lot of energy. Like I can do it. But again, it takes a lot of energy to just sit there and, and observe. And there's been plenty of times where I've had to do that. And it was good for me. Um, but I don't like it. It's not what I like doing. So I'll probably, um, uh, I might just leave, you know, if it's just a social conversation and I have nothing to contribute, I'll probably get bored and want to go do something else. But mm -hmm. session, if something comes up where it's not my expertise, I refer people out, I give them the little bit I can, or I try to help them, you know, find, you know, what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well said, well said. And so Follymetric asks, what's the worst YouTube rabbit hole you found yourself in where you couldn't stop watching? I'd say there's a number of them. Like, 
I'm not big into social media. Like, I don't think I've gone on my, I don't think I've posted anything on my Facebook since high school, you know, and anything I've posted on Facebook or Instagram or whatever since then was just for like business promotion stuff. I really don't like, um, you know, how it feels to engage with those media. Um, I don't like what it brings out in me brings out a lot of anxieties, you know, like, oh, how, did I get enough likes on this thing? And I'm like, oh, this isn't what I want to spend my energy on. This, what good did this do the world that I put this picture out there? Like, I'm, I'm sharing a lot about myself today, but I, I really believe in your project that you have here, you know, and I mean project in the grand sense, you know, that you, you've got a, a, a beautiful vision for what you're creating, this compendium of knowledge. I mean, it's like a typology video library you're creating. And I think that um, sharing us sharing our stories with each other is the as human beings is one of the best ways to help each other and to learn and to, you know, in some way make the world a little better. And so, yeah, I'll, I'll put myself out there for something that's worthwhile, but social media not so much. But YouTube, I I will get sucked in. I mean, what rabbit hole haven't I gotten sucked into? I. I think one of the ones that I'm sort of least embarrassed about, I mean, none of them are really bad, but you know, some of them were like, all right, am I going to say that? <laughs> yeah. It's like, but um, I'd say the one of the ones that I'm least embarrassed about, but still sort of rabbit holy is um, uh, British comedy panel shows. I stumbled across, uh, I think the first thing was, Nine out of 10 cats does countdown and Sean Locke on there and Jimmy Carr's banter and uh, John Richardson's banter. I thought Sean Locke was hilarious and he actually only recently passed away, unfortunately. So that was really sad, but he was hilarious. And then they had, they like swapped out the guests and it, there's some, there's some strange habit with, I guess the BBC or with British comedians where each famous British comedian gets their own show and then their guests are just the hosts of all the other shows. Like you just all the, so I would be like, Oh, that was a really funny guest. They got their own show. So I'd go watch that show. And so I would say now what I will watch, I will rewatch these videos and I will laugh as if I'm watching it for the first time are the, would I lie to you clips where the comedian David Mitchell, I think, is easily my favorite, although I do love Rob and uh, and Lee as well. Uh, the show wouldn't be the same without three all three of them. But I will watch David Mitchell rant about these logical things, you know, into the wee hours of the night. And I've seen those rants already. But something about his, like, his wit, his quickness, his logic... And, and like the energy he puts behind, how he cares about these distinctions. One, I really relate to that. I can rant about some of the most minute things you could imagine. Um, you know, grammatical things, you know, like the difference between this word or that word, or like, uh, like in Marvel, you know, like, uh, and I, I, you know, I know you like Marvel as much as I do, or, we're, you know, we're, we're Marvel fans in that way together. But some of the breaches of physics in Marvel, I could rant about that for days. Like uh, Captain America. You watch the first Avenger, right? And mm -hmm. it's a throwaway line. They're explaining how the super serum works. And there's just a throwaway line where he says, his metabolism is 10 times the speed of a normal human. And everyone just goes, ooh. And that's why he's all like ripped and like, you know, uh, lean. Do you know how much that man would have to eat if he had a metabolism 10 times the speed of a normal human? How many meals a day are we supposed to eat? Like, you know, FDA says three, three square meals a day is the, the classic thing they say in the U.S. He'd have to eat 30 meals, 20,000 calories. He, he'd have to wake up in the middle of the night to eat, just not to pass out. He'd be stopping in the middle of fights, being like eating some Tony Tony Stark 
super granola bar that's like 50,000 calories just so he's not like huh, 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 after swinging that super shield around like he's made out of like you know plutonium i mean it's like that's a ridiculous he would die so fast you know like, he'd be like he'd the lifespan of a vole he'd, he'd die five times as fast as everyone else you know so I got a whole bunch of those things. And so David Mitchell goes on these rants and it's hilarious. And I will go down so many rabbit holes in a conversation, let alone on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I notice about ENFPs is that they get really impassioned. They get on these rants about specific things. And I think it's the NEFI. The NE is like, it fuels the amount of arguments you have. And then the FI is like, I feel impassioned about this. And so I'll have ENFP friends ranting to me about why avocados should not be the side to every salad or every meal. It makes no sense. <laughs> well, we could get, um, I, you know, the ENFP person that I was bantering with earlier threw up a comment about like the untapped infinite energy potential of two, ENF, two ENFPs talking to each other or bantering together. And I think if we, we got someone pro avocado and someone anti avocado, we and we could harness that energy, we might solve the energy crisis and like save, you know, global warming issues. You heard the solution here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and so Len asks, um, question for you both. Do you think ENFPs and INFJs are in an internal disagreement? I find I argue with my INFJ friends the most. Ha. Hmm. What are your thoughts on that? Let's see. Um, I, I usually have to take a second to remember the top two functions of all 16 types. So we've got INFJ. So we've got uh, NIFE. NIFE. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think the NI, the NINE difference, like I was saying with my uh, my friend Kyle, is an obstacle. And I think that FEFI is an obstacle as well. I think they will be perpetually in eternal disagreement to the to the uh, to the extent that neither one of them has sort of done their work to appreciate those alternative perspectives or values. Or if they're tired, you know, if we're not on our A game, it takes a lot of energy to like set our preferences aside and see it through the other, you know, the other lenses. Um, I think the NI person is going, I think the INFJ is going to get really annoyed really fast because of the NEs sort of all over the placeness. I suspect the um, ENFP is going to get sort of dismissive of those FE uh, focus, the FE's focus on everyone else's feelings to their own their own detriment um what are what are your thoughts joyce yeah so there can be an ne versus ni tension between them both so sometimes an infj or an intj will tell an enfp hey don't do that that it will have consequences but the enfp will be like well you didn't tell me why because they want to know why I shouldn't do it but they don't voice that so what happens is sometimes they'll just go ahead and do the thing and then the NI Dom's like you did the thing that I told you not to do and then now you're doing what the consequences that we already knew was going to happen and then ENFP's like well I, I wanted to ask you like or I asked you like why and you didn't provide me the concrete reasons or reasons that were compelling enough for me to not do it so it's just what's convincing to both the parties is not convincing enough until they get into a bad situation and then they get into a feud over it. Um, sometimes the FI and the FE can clash too. An ENFP may act out in a situation where they're like, this is not right. This is not moral. This is not, this is outside of my values. And so sometimes they'll create social tension or tension in like, un, like to, what to FE can look like you're disrupting how other people are feeling or and, and then that can cause that type of friction as well it's like oh that was the the infj with their fe might be like that's unnecessary conflict that you're causing 
And the ENFP is like, that's totally necessary conflict. We, we have to solve this. Like this person's cheating on this person. You need to let that person know so that they know what they're involved with because that's not more. But then it causes a lot of tension. So a lot of things can happen where the, the values of the different functions will clash. Like what Kevin was saying earlier, FI to FE is like ick and the FE to FI is like ick. But they're also attracted to each other too. So I find ENFPs tend to catch INFJs, like their Pokemon, and they throw their Pokeballs. But at the same time, they're friends, but that tension grows them if it can grow them, or it can drift them apart depending on the pairing. So it can either make them stronger and they can learn to deal with the function differences, or it can tear them apart because they start to grow underlying resentment for how they think differently. And so, Kevin, you are a very easygoing and personable person. Does it take a conscious effort for you to be so, or is it as natural as breathing for you? Do you aim to have such a presence? I think at this point, my agreeableness is um, something that I have on a slider. And I can choose sort of how agreeable or disagreeable I want to be most of the time when I'm like on my A game. When I'm when I'm in it, when I'm in my issues, when I've got a bad day, um, I am going to be much more disagreeable. Um, when I've got the energy for it though, I can crank that agreeableness right up and sort of try for his super charisma. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, like in, like as a therapist, I have to do a lot of relationship building. Um, I, I'm lucky enough to, uh, work with a lot of clients that I like most of my clients I like. And, um, if, if not all of them, some of them I have to work a little harder to like, but, um, it's, uh, I, I think I'm sort of lucky in that way. Um, some social workers are in positions where they're going to deal with a lot of people that are very hard to like. Um, so when I'm trying to build those relationships, especially with clients like teen clients who are here against their will or court mandated clients, um, I might have to sort of judge what's the right thing for that moment. How agreeable do I need to be? And I, I know how to be agreeable most of the time. It's not a question of being oblivious to it. I think that's where it then comes back to the FI as what's, what does the situation need? So sometimes I have clients where um, they're looking for me to agree with them, but if I agree with them, it actually harms them because what they're doing is uh, either dangerous for themselves, like some sort of high risk behavior that they think is fun or cool um, or uh, some other sort of harmful behavior that's harmful themselves or others. And I, and they're looking to bond with me on it, and I have to intentionally go, no, that's that's not that's not uh, that's not going to get you the life you want. That's not fitting with the goals that you've brought to me that you want to address. And here's how. Um, so I I think I've done a lot of work to build personas, you know, being able to match what a situation wants from me. And like I was saying a little earlier, part of that was my own just you know, uh, self-preservation. Um, but I think since developing more FI abilities and grounding, I'm able to put the mask on and take it off. Um, that I, I wear the persona rather than the persona wearing me. And when it's necessary, I can switch from being really agreeable and pleasant and enjoyable to saying, this does not continue. This is not okay. Um, and, you know, even further in the, you know, stern or loud categories, depending on the sort of shape shifting the situation calls for. Well put. And so I love Wooden Stamp and Celtic Knots as an INFP, but how on earth do you discover that kind of interesting any stuff? I'm eager to discover these things, but I only keep finding boring things. So you, you hit the good stuff, Kevin. People are jealous. <laughs> I'm actually having a little trouble like understanding the question. Maybe you can help me with this, Joyce. Oh, it they're just wondering where you're finding all of these amazing rabbit holes, I guess. 
Okay, I was. That's why I was like, I'm not sure if this person is asking um, if I can suggest cool ne activities for them, or like what, like uh, they're looking. I, I see that they're looking for interesting things, and they're finding boring things. I'm just not quite sure what direction interesting lies for them. Are they trying to find stuff that's ne? Where like I found the Celtic knot stuff would be more of an introverted, interesting thing. Like what would be an interesting like playing with the NE function? Is that sort of what's going on here? Sure, let's go that route. <laughs> okay, um, hopefully that is sort of moving in the right direction. Um, Cause I don't know, but I'll trust you, Joyce. You're the master of the realm. Um, I, I think um, improv is a playing in an NE way. There's the, the sort of classic improv where there's like an improv troupe or improv classes. But there's also ways to improvise even within otherwise very structured um, practices. Like I studied Tai Chi for um, some years. And while going through the forms, the forms are very prescribed, like what order you go through motions and how the motion's supposed to be done. You also have to be very spontaneous, like whether that's in the game of push hands and responding to what your um, partner is doing, or whether it's responding to what the weather is doing. Um, I think there's a lot of spontaneity in poetry. If you're able to, you know, get into the poetry world, um, you know the rules of grammar, you know the structure of something like a haiku or a sonnet, which is a very um, uh, a very highly structured form, but within that structure you can play. You can say, ah, but what, but what if I don't put a comma there? Or what if I capitalize this thing that usually isn't? And there's, there's lots of ways to improv either in otherwise introverted um, endeavors, which would be, I think, an NE thing. Um, I would say another way that I really like playing with the NE is in a dream interpretation and also looking at films and myths and legends and fairy tales symbolically or looking at um, uh, art in a symbolic way, I think that's a very NE thing to do, sort of playing with, like in music, there's there's this thing called overtones where you have the fundamental note, which you would think of as like the note that's being played. But if you listen carefully, you can hear with most instruments or, or most voices that there are, are sort of ethereal notes hovering above each one of those main notes. Um, and I think that's the same way that a symbol in a, in a movie or a play, that you have the image, but then there's all these meanings that you can explore. And I think the NE loves doing that. I, I think I also play with these valences and overtones of meanings with puns. I love puns. And I will, if you give me a topic, I can just riff on that topic I had a friend where we would play this game with puns where we'd pick a topic and we'd have to take turns coming up with a pun and whoever couldn't come up with a pun first lost the game. And we would go for like an hour, if not more before, because we were very stubborn and competitive and we would not give up on these puns, but I'll just like throw out the puns and I can't not hear them. Someone will say a word and I just, it resonates in both of those meaning valences at once. So I, those are some ways that you could play with the NE function, um, looking at sim symbolism and, and different meanings of the same symbol. Mm -hmm. Well put, well put. How would you describe your relationship with people, strangers versus acquaintances versus close relationships? Um. I would say with strangers, my main goal is uh, manners and politeness, unless there's a really good reason not to be polite. Um, there's 
rarely good reason not to be polite, I think, uh, with strangers. Um, so with strangers, I, I might make small talk. Like if I'm on a bus, like going to the airport and there's a bunch of people around, I might say, so where are you headed? Have a little chat. Um, that's fun. That's fun for me. I like getting to um, have some, some small talk. Uh, again, unless I'm really tired. Because sometimes the small talk banter is energizing. Um, with acquaintances, there is a little bit more sharing. I'm usually looking for points of connection. I try to even go out of my way to find points of connection and being able to relate together. Um, I think connecting with people is not always enjoyable, but I think it is enjoyable. And I think a lot of people in this world would say or, or might feel at some point that they feel sort of lonely or unseen. And if in that moment you can see each other even in a little bit, I, I think that that's a really worthwhile experience. Um, there is a... There is like a, a vast stretch of distance between how I am with acquaintances and how I am with my close relationships. Like my close relationships are, that that's a castle that's hard to get behind the walls of, you know. Um, I can share quite a bit with acquaintances and strangers without ever letting them into that inner sanctum. Um, so sometimes acquaintances will feel like we're close friends even though maybe I don't consider them that way. Once someone gets on the other side of the cliff, and here's why that's like, you might say, oh, Kevin, you're so defensive. You're so worried about being wounded. Well, sure, somewhat, that doesn't feel good. I don't wanna let in, in, let in anyone who's not going to be honoring of me. I'm not gonna let someone in just to trash the place, you know, the place being my heart. Um, but once someone's in, once someone's a close relationship, I they, they're there and I have to wrestle with that. Meaning if I let them in and things go south, love is unconditional. They say unconditional love, that's a redundancy. Love is always unconditional. If it's conditional, it's not love. However, relationships are always conditional. And that means that once someone gets in, once someone is a close friend, once I love them in that way, I can't undo that. And I, it's not my, I, I'm, the heart is not mine to command. So it's not that I can make it love or make it not love. But there are people who have profoundly hurt me and profoundly let me down that were once very close friends. And they're still in there. Uh, you know, they show up in dreams. I think about them and I miss them. I'm sad. There is no space for them in my life. They are not welcome and they have broken. Um, they have broken trust in a way that can never be repaired to us, for us to have a relationship. But they're still in the heart and I don't think they're ever going to leave. So I, I you know, I, w I let my guard down in a way that um, with close friends that I don't do with anyone else. I'll, I'll banter with more extremity. I'll, I'll dance, you know, with, with ideas or wrestle with things that I wouldn't share with other people because they don't know me well enough to not judge me about it while I work through those, those struggles. So when it comes to close friendships, you know, they are in and that I that gives them an ability to hurt me that like no one else can. And I've been hurt like that. And I've decided that I will continue to open my heart. I will open my heart to my clients. I will open my heart to the world. I will open my heart to nature. And I will open my heart to new close friendships, um, knowing that they're in. And uh, that's a that's a loyalty to that that I'll have to carry. And so I need to be careful with that. Yeah, they call it the NEFI heart. So mm -hmm. there's the NE heart, 
you know, everyone thinks they're kind of closer to the ENFP than they are. And so ENFPs are really good at making people feel like they're their best friend, but they don't mean it. It's just they're so friendly and personable that people feel close immediately to the ENFP. But that's the NE heart. So it's the heart that's open to just the love of people, you know, love of humanity, love of the world. And so there's that innate love. And then there's the FI heart, which is you're a really special person if you get into the FI heart because it's made for a special select few is VIP. But once you're there in the FI heart, you are there for life. And no matter where you are, no matter where you what you're doing or no matter what your your state is, they will always love you. Because their their FI isn't attached to SE too. So it's not fleeting with moments like SI is is permanent, this permanent representation of you in their mind with their FI. And it's one of the deepest loves, I would say, but it's just really hard to get there. <laughs> speaking so, of, speaking yeah. of SE and deep love, um, uh, my wife, Annie, I am so madly in love with Annie and she says the same about me. So I'll believe her. And uh, I believe her. And um, she is my best friend in the world, and we just had our first child, and who's going to be turning one in March. Mm -hmm. And um, she has SE preferences. So, on one side, like she finds my NE to be like charming and engaging, and on one side, she, on the other side, she's like so annoyed when I'm talking about these future possibilities that we need to account for now because they're not happening now. Why are we worried about this? And on the other side, like for me, you know, I um, I love her like playfulness and spontaneity and her appreciation for for beauty and joy. You know, she's such a delightful person um, in a way I could only hope to be. She's just innately delightful. And uh, I say that her favorite colors are rainbow and sparkles, you know, for uh, her SE preferences. And um and then when it comes to the like some of that, I'm like, no, we have to look into the future. Like, why are you ignoring these future things that are real? And she's like, ah, they're not real. And I'd say that's where most of our conflicts come from is the SE because uh, she's ESFP. So our our FITE, you know, we're like right there with each other. But with the S, the SE and the NE, I'm like, but the future is real. And she's like, no, it's not. And, you know, pay attention to what's happening now. Why can't you just be present and enjoy it? And I'm like, but, but. <laughs> yeah, that, that is the very interesting, <laughs> interesting dynamic. I find EPs oftentimes end up with other EPs. Hmm. It is the cycle of life. I'm, I'm kidding, but there's truth to that. <laughs> <laughs> and so Folymetric asks, you don't remember anything from last night, but now my uncle is aggressively grilling you about his destroyed $10,000 miniature boat that was in the room you slept in. How would you calm him down? <laughs> <laughs> you know, in linguistic, I took a linguistics class in college that I really enjoyed a lot. I love language. And there's a phrase in linguistics that like one of the special things about language is that they're all fixed things, right? The words, we can agree on what they mean most of the time, right? That's how language works. Um, and yet there's so much creativity that we, with these fixed known things, we can create novel utterances, things that have never before been heard or will never be heard from since. Um, there's a YouTube video people can look up that we used in class called, uh, uh, it's the S swear word out of politeness. I will refrain from using it, but it's the S that nobody says. And it's like, hmm, how can I make papyrus my default font? You know, and uh, hmm, this terrible thing smells great. So uh, there's, it's, it's much wittier, but you can check that out. This is a novel utterance. I have never had this question asked before. And uh, that's wonderful. So... Now that my ENFP initial tangent is over, to the question. Um, my first question is, why don't I remember anything from the night before? Like, what happened to me? Like, there's probably a substance involved. I personally don't like substances, you know, that affect me, you know, in that way. Why don't I remember what happened? Something's gone horribly wrong, even in the first premise of this. Um, 
how would I calm him down? I don't know. Maybe he needs to be upset. He obviously cares about this little boat. Maybe I don't calm him down. Maybe I just empathize. Maybe I say like, I'm really sorry about your miniature boat. Um, <laughs> you know, I might, uh, I, I don't know. I'd really have, to, how important is this person to me? You know, how like whoever's uncle this is like, do I care about the uncle? Do I care about <laughs> the friend whose uncle it is? If I don't, I'd be like, I don't know anything about your boat. You know, good luck. If I do care, I might say, I might start to problem solve. I might be like, um, you know, maybe we can fix it together. You know, maybe we can find you a new one. Uh, let's retrace the clues. When was the last time you used the boat? Does anyone remember what I was doing last night? <laughs> Does anyone remember what anyone was doing last night? <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's the best I've got. It's a great question, but I don't have anything else for it, unfortunately. That was too funny. And so Katie asks, the chat is having an interesting conversation about avocados. Do you have some thoughts on the topic of said fruit? Hmm. I like avocados. They are tasty. They're an excellent source of healthy fats, so I am told. They are a great uh, addition to smoothies to make them creamy. I, I use a lot of avocado oil because of its high flash point. You know, degraded, saturated oils are, uh, you know, they give me migraines. So that's not good. But, uh, you know, uh, not really good for anyone. Um, I'd say one of the interesting things about avocados, and I don't know if this is true. So, you know, you know, do your own fact checking on this one. Um, I'm told that there's actually a ridiculous number of avocados that are left to rot in the field. Because if all of the avocados that were grown were put to market, they would like drop in value. And I, I was told, and again, maybe this isn't true. I was told that actually dogs love avocados. And this fact is intentionally left out of the avocado marketing because they are their brand is like this bougie, like specialty item you know, ooh, put it on toast, you know, and now it's fancy, you know. And so, like, if they start marketing or advertising, that, oh, buy them for your dog, they're not going to command the price. So there's tons of food waste from avocados just hanging out in the fields or in the grounds or where I, I don't know how avocados grow. And, uh, you know, uh, when they could be used because, you know, uh, they've got to maintain their image. So I do think that, you know, as a millennial, I do think the accusations against us enjoying avocado toast are, are unfair. Unfair. First of all, that is not an extravagant food dish. That is that is warm bread and a and like a fruit or a vegetable. Okay. That is not opulence. And as I said, they're only opulent because they brand themselves to make themselves opulent. Um so I'd, I'd back off. If the worst thing this generation does is underperform and eat avocado toast, I, I think, you know, there's worse things to do as a millennial. But um, those are some of my topic, my my thoughts on off the cuff on the topic of avocados. Yeah, yeah. To summarize, avocado don't. <laughs> or avocado. Yeah, true. We have a cat named guacamole. So mm. another, which... Annie named before she ever ever had the food. She'd never had guacamole, thought the word sounded cool. Now we have a very persnickety cat named guacamole who we love. And she is in charge of all the other cats. Adorable. Yeah. And so what types do you get along the most with? I would say that that's really difficult. Because even in just the smallest circle of my current best friends, we have ESFP, ESTP, INTJ, um, probably a couple others I'm not thinking about. Um, I would say that it is probably hardest for me to connect with people with SI preferences, probably because 
my inferior function and all. Um, that's not across the board. There are plenty of SI people that I really enjoy talking to. Um, uh, e ESTJs, you know, can be really enjoyable conversation partners. But again, I think that's sort of our TEs bonding on that one. Um, yeah, I, I would say the FI people, I can create some of those closer connections with a little easier, you know, um, sometimes in those, in those sort of quieter moments. However, um, you know, I've got an ENFP friend that we just get into it sometimes and it just is endless fun. Um, we also can annoy the crap out of each other. So that, that there's that, but I mean, we, we all have so many interests and we love like a lot of the same things and we'll just, you know, this friend in particular, like, um, will we both love chess we both speak russian he speaks more russian and knows more chess than me but uh like we'll just sit there play playing chess and laughing and bantering for hours and like telling cool stories to each other so um you know that's 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 really delightful and fun but i i have so many close friends that are like in that inner circle that are such different types so i don't i don't know if i could um answer any more specifically than that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where do you find things to use your NA? Do you just randomly wander around websites and such? Well, I can't turn the NE off. It's the eyes with which I see everything. <laughs> um, I use it with everything too. I mean, that's the thing is the NE is always like, how can I use this? You know, what are the possibilities here? Um, it just gets fed into this endless fantasy rendering generation. It's like those, those, uh, those random name generators and stuff you can find online where like you put in a prompt word and then it generates all the different band names you could have related to that idea. Like that's the NE. You could put anything in the NE and it'll just start churning stuff out endlessly. It's like an endless exercise in brainstorming, you know, with the imagination. Um, now, I, I, as far as like, I do like to wander. Uh, my wanderings usually, I'm sort of following a red thread. So there might be something that sort of pops up. Maybe that's from the NI goes, hey, maybe you should check this thing out. And then I go check it out. And then there's a suggested video below, or there's a, a related um, reference in the bibliography in the back of a book. Um, but I, I think almost a, like I'm sort of a collector. You know, I just collect ideas, stories, things. I hate forgetting stuff. I love you know, if I've experienced it and gone through that, I want to remember it and I want to be able to reference it and connect it to other stuff. So I've just created more and more connections and ideas. So um, I never have to go out of my way to find any things. I have to go out of my way to turn it off. Yeah, the endless permutations or ways that you can see things is real. Do you, your feelings get agitated easily? Yeah, I think the simple answer to that is yes. Um, but what I don't have to do is show it. So it's easy to hurt my feelings. It really is. I think of myself as a particularly strong person, but it's easy to hurt my feelings. But what it's not easy to do is get me to do something because of it. So if you're trying to convince me to change my actions by hurting my feelings, that's that's going to be really hard. It's not easy to manipulate me uh, that way. Um, but, you know, whether this is typological or whether it's part of my training as a therapist, um, my feelings are like a stethoscope for a, for a doctor. It's a it's a highly sensitive tool that I can use to listen to very soft, subtle differences. 
that I am my best diagnostic instrument in a session. And so someone walks in and I just, it's almost like a sense of smell. I go, ah, you know, they're feeling more anxious today. Or someone comes in for a first session and, and within 30 seconds, I already have like 90% of what we're going to be working on the entire time we're together. Um, that's partly the NE too. But the problem with that is like, I can't take the stethoscope out. So I can't watch certain movies or TV shows specifically around dysfunction. Um, I can't watch shows that celebrate or embrace dysfunction. It's okay for there to be dysfunction as long as the, the like, the message or the content in the show isn't like normalizing it or, or like validating it. Not that, you know, I mean, what's more normal than pathology, right? We all have our issues, but um, the person has to be like working on it or the message of the movie has to be like, you know, yes, we have flaws, but we can still be lovable anyway. But if it's one of those like drama shows where the, the, like the tension comes from every character being endlessly messed up and just inflicting their pain and suffering on everyone around them in just new and creatively cruel ways. Oh, I, it's like screaming into that stethoscope. I just, I can't watch it. Um, so there's a lot of things like that where I'm just so sensitive to it. I, I just can't, I can't deal with it. And I will, uh, I will avoid those things, even if someone else finds them entertaining. Mm hmm. Yeah, you sound like you have an empathic side to you, and that you're able to gauge the subtleties within a person's um, changing feelings because you have your FI is so in tune with it because you you really care. And so it's a part of the NF temperament too. So the NF's curiosity says one of the core values of NF's is empathy. And so I feel like that was a good demonstration of that. Hmm. So yeah. Would you say you worry about others more than yourself or is it dependent on the circumstance? I think when I'm not particularly on my A game, that NE wants to worry about everything. So it will worry about everything. Um, so I think there is sort of a hierarchy Basically, the closer you are to me, the more I'm going to worry about you. So me being at the center of that hierarchy, I'm going to worry a lot about me. So probably most me overall. But what I'm worried about is like, am I being a good person? So even when I'm worrying about me, I'm worrying about how I'm affecting others or how I'm going to affect others. So there's some paradox in there. But uh, you know, I, I worry about my close friends. I worry about, you know, what issue, again, this is sort of the NE or maybe even NI sometimes, like how will the situation that's going on with so-and-so unfold? Is there a way that I can help it unfold in a better way or help them avoid this trauma or this problem or this issue? Um, and so I do, I think about other people a lot. And I think that is part of my process as a therapist too, is that even when I'm not in session with someone, I'm thinking about our last session, I'm thinking about our next session, I'm thinking about how that fits in. I don't like obsess about it and I do have my own life, but excuse me, within that, I'm able to, to worry about a lot of people. I guess since my job as a therapist is in some ways, not worry in an anxious way, but worry in a contemplative and consideration way. I guess I've made a profession out of worrying about others. So maybe if we add everyone else up, it is more than how much I worry about myself. But any one individual, it's probably going to be me. Mm -hmm. But again, it's about me contributing more often. Sometimes it's about me protecting myself, but it's a mix. Yeah, if it costs you your peace, it is too expensive. So it's good to protect yourself so that you can give more to other people. Because if you just wear yourself down, then it's almost like you're trying to drive a car with no gas. That doesn't work. Um, so do you have any hobbies? We answered that at the beginning. He, he's like very hop. He's a, he has a many hobbies. Um, N.E. tends to be 
um, multi potential light or people like a polymath, a, a person of many jack of all trades. I try, I try to still be a master of at least one, though. That's where I don't want to get so spread thin that I don't have any depth in any one thing. But yes, I, I will have a rotation on the periphery of things that I am interested in while I keep a few things constantly deepening in the center. Can, can I say, Joyce, I really think you do a great job with this format. Like you make such space for me as a speaker. You have like great engagement with the with your um, the questions here and you have such good framings and, and things to say. So I just wanted to you know point that out that, you know, this is this is awesome. And thank you for hosting this. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate you and I appreciate your really interesting spins on the questions. Y you mentioned a word called, I think, unique utterances or novel utterances. Novel utterances. You are the embodiment of that. <laughs> <laughs> There's an author I really like. Um, I don't think I've read all of his books, but I read a lot of them. Um, Tom Robbins, and there's some sketchy elements to his book. So I'm not, I'm not saying like this is a wholesale endorsement of him. But what I do love about his stuff is that there are some of the wackiest characters that have the most unexpected things, even unexpected superpowers, like super ability to hitchhike and stuff like that. But he he weaves his stories with these elaborate um intertwining. Uh, unexpected plots with these bizarre characters. And uh, and again, some of them are not good people and some of them are not good characters and some of them don't do good things. Um, but I think to myself that if I'm living my life in a way that resembles the plot of a Tom Robbins novel and the more I resemble that sort of eccentric Tom Robbins character, I think I'm I'm sort of living life the right way. Yeah, you're making it in life. You're in the right direction. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, if it's too predictable and stereotypic, what am I really doing? What am I adding to this world? Yeah, you, you got to reinvent the wheel. That is life. <laughs> and so musical interests? Is, well, I'm, I'm a vocal performer. Uh, like I said, I'm a classically trained operatic bass. Um, so... As far as singing, I love stuff. I love singing low. I love stuff with like sort of sustained longer tones to it. I love singing in, in harmony. Oh, a good, let me be a good bass harmony. You know, I don't need the melody. I don't need to stand out just to like hold the sound from the bottom of the, of the tonal structure. I just love that. Um, as far as listening tastes, it's really bizarre. You know, I, I will not pre pretend to have refined tastes when it comes to music or even movies, you know. Um, in, a mo in movies, I like a good, good guy and a bad, bad guy and watch the good guy beat the crap out of the bad guy and scene. You know, like I will rewatch that. Um, part of why I like Marvel, you know. Um, Black Panther, Captain America, you know, good guys with superhero superpowers doing good things, you know. Uh, Wonder Woman, another one of my favorites, especially because she gets so underestimated and then just like wows everybody. So good. Um, music, I like. Um, I like some choral music, but I'm I am oppressively snobbish, even for myself, with vocal technique where it, I like feel it viscerally if it's not good and I can't listen to it. It like makes me feel sick, like, like, like I've got a scratchy throat. In the same way, like you hear someone scream really bad, like it hurts your voice to hear it. It's like that, but way more sensitive, which is very annoying, but it is what it is. Um, that being said, I really like pop music and, I sus and electronic sort of music, and I suspect it's partly because the voices are so overproduced that my body doesn't recognize that it's a human voice. So that effect doesn't happen because the tech, I know the technique isn't right, but my body doesn't care. And I think it's because it can't hear it as a human voice because it's so distorted. 
But I, I, as I said earlier, I love the Russian language. Um, I studied in Russia for a little bit of time. Um, I'm not completely fluent, but I'm at least conversant in Russian and I love speaking Russian. So I love singing in Russian. So Russian folk songs, we've, we've got Russian folk songs, pop music, choral music. And then the last thing, and this is my favorite band, um, is called Boca Marimba. And they are out of, they are out of uh, Portland, Oregon, and they are an African marimba band. And a marimba, for people who don't know, is is a wooden. It's like a giant xylophone where you hit the bars and they make different sounds, and they're made out of wood. Um, they have like eight or nine, even more sometimes, marimbas of different pitch, different voices, and it is a wall of sound. When you see them live, the, the recordings are good, but the live music is like unimaginable. Uh, the whole instrument sings. It's not just the bars, the whole thing resonates and it's just this wall of like immensely happy and joyful sounds. It's like, it's like if you imagine a forest of trees singing and dancing in this music. And um, that is easily my favorite band. And they, seeing them live is like nothing else and makes me feel like nothing else. And it is too bad that they are 2,000 miles away. So I have to just settle for the recordings for now. But that's my favorite band, Boca Marimba. So they're a genre unto themselves in my music taste. Yeah, that's wonderful. I felt like I got a taste out of it through listening to your description. <laughs> if you're listening, Boca Marimba, Keep on keeping on. The world needs you. <laughs> you know when you're in Chicago. <clears throat> and so this is the last question of the night. Katie asks, how do you collect and save memories? By writing, photographing, collecting items, or some other ring? I, um, I memorize. I just do. Um, I I have to take notes for you know medical record purposes, but I don't like take notes in sessions. And I remember my clients' girlfriends, their past girlfriends, their their siblings, their uncles, their uh, the events you know from the past. They'll come back after being gone from therapy for a while. You know, we sort of worked through one thing and we called it mission accomplished. And they'll come back years later and say, oh, yeah, we worked on this. And I'll go, oh, you know, I remember. And I'll be able to. And your girlfriend was this and your brother was that. And, and you, this was the issue that brought you in. And they're like, yeah. And like it amazes people. Th that being said, I love collecting things. Um, I have lots of tchotchkes. I have lots of um, sacred things that... Um, have memories connected to them, but also have meaning. Like each one tells a story and I remember where they came from. Um, so I usually don't have to collect memories. They just sort of, I just memorize. I memorize words and events. I'll watch a movie once and remember whole sections of dialogue or minute details. I can memorize songs pretty quickly. I think part of that is the 14, plays and musicals and operas I've been in as like lead characters where I've had to memorize lots of stuff or other performance things. But uh, yeah, but before, before we end, um, and I know we're at the end here with the hard cutoff, I just wanted to say, you know, um, I really enjoyed this. There's a lot of great discussion um, ever present for me. And maybe this is my FI coming out. There's a lot of issues in the world that are very serious and that, you know, got no airtime today. And I don't think that's necessarily, you know, um, bad. It's inescapable. We talk about one thing, we can't talk about others. Um, but I just wanted to, to say that, you know, things with the environment really need our attention in general. You know, again, not to the exclusion of very important things like this and other things like um, that we could be talking about. But I just wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, Go out, you know, as the FI, go out there. There's plenty of issues, people. F find one that speaks to you. Do some good work. Environment, oppressed peoples. There's there's a lot of work needs doing out there. And uh, and then enjoy yourself so that you don't ha burn out on it. Yeah, yeah. Find your FI cause and fight for it because the world needs more people who fight for the right thing so that 
yep. things are are moral and things are just. So bring justice into the world and find the things that you're willing to fight for so that the world becomes a better place. With every brick, you're either adding a brick to creating a heaven on earth or adding a brick to creating a hell on earth. And so it's really important to find certain causes that light you up and so that you add something really well to the world, a, a brick to create heaven on earth almost. My mentor, Kevin Redbear Dubrow, who I mentioned before, is, uh, you know, very much inspired me in that way. He lived his life doing the best he could for the most number of people. And I don't know what type preferences he was. I have some theories. Um, but that's where The Impossible Dream was one of his favorite songs. And I think that really sums up a lot of the FI function. Um, dream the impossible dream try to reach that unreachable star, because what else are we supposed to do with our time that is so precious and limited, but try to make the world at least a little bit better because we were here today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. And I think it's a lesson everyone could learn from. It's, it's trying to make the world a better place through your, you have a part in it. It's almost like you matter and you create an, a world every time you act in the world. And so you, you mentioned a saying at the beginning, Kevin, you said, when you choose, when you choose everything or you choose not to choose, you're actually making a decision at that choice. Yeah. So your statement about NE actually applies to everything and it applies to right now about how if you choose to do nothing, then it's actually, it's a choice and it, and it's when, when you could be using it towards something that you care about, whatever that thing is for you. And yeah. so that's really empowering. You're, you're getting people to tap into their FI. Yeah. You were able to tap into your FI and now you're empowering everyone else. You have some FI, you have some <laughs> FI, you have some FI. Look under your seat, people. FI for everybody. You're getting FI. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. And so if you enjoyed listening to Kevin today, I sure did. You're really entertaining, but you're able to weave in important messages too. So you're, you're able to show people that you care and then they listen to you because they see you as one of us. And so there's a saying, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. And you're very good at letting people know that you care about them. And so everyone's very touched by you. <laughs> and if you would like to see more of Kevin and others who are very, very cool too, you can check out the APTI Winter Conference that's happening happening February 25th and 26th. And you can hear more of Kevin's inspiring messages and talks about his cats like guacamole there too. And so from one NF to another, uh, thank you for creating a world where you're able to see the potential in the world, the future potential, and encourage others to dream a little bigger too, to use their imagination to imagine a better world. And so thank you everyone for asking your wonderful questions. You thank you. really entertained all of the any users. <laughs> and I'll see you all in the next episode. Bye. Thank you very much everyone. Bye Joyce. Bye.